Good morning. I feel blessed to be here. Yeah. So the most important moment we have is right now, this moment. This is the gift that we've been given. And so right now, we can make a choice what we want to listen to. Do we want to listen to our noisy, egoic mind? Or do we want to listen to spirit? What spirit has to say. So that's happening uh, whether we're in church or we're in a meditation practice, you know, whether we're helping someone out, going through their struggles, uh, whether we're at work and there's a lot of uh, competing demands going on, we're on a trip in the airport, you know, driving, whatever. There's there's always this this choice to make on what voice we're going to listen to. This is this is a challenge that that every human faces. Every human, all seven billion, <laughs> more, whatever, eight billion. But the good thing about this is that we're actually aware at some level that this is happening. That that's the advantage we have now as we practice the tools of, that Unity has given us. That it's actually going on. There's there's a lot of man that's asleep to the choice, and so they just go on with their day and whatever shows up in their mind, they don't even really look at it, just a, a routine of some program. Maybe it's just uh, very stressful, I would imagine. Maybe there's sometimes that it's just driven by pleasure. But the ego doesn't have a lot of choices. Uh, it's really the same content, just a different spin or form to what you're gonna listen to with the ego and its programs. Its programs are often very stressful, anxiety driven, looking for pleasures, you know, waking up in the morning and well, I'm going to seek out what's most pleasurable to me today, or I'm just going to fall stress, or I'm going to avoid today what's stressful. Maybe I'm going to isolate at home. Uh, maybe there's some things I'll do that feel comfortable to me. Others I'm not, you know, this is just kind of what the ego does every day. And even us that have been uh, accustomed to practicing the principles of unity can get stuck in that, that theme as well. But it's important to stop wherever we're at in the moment and just be still and look and, and scan our awareness. Be mindful of the present moment and what's happening now. We have that choice we can make. If we're driving and we stop at a red light, we can tune in that moment to the inner life. This one moment, this, the most important moment. Ultimately, everything that's going on is happening in this moment. The past is being remembered. We may be projecting into the future what we want to happen with our day, but it's all happening now <laughs> in our consciousness. Now, there are some other, of course, there's other things happening that we don't understand, like the process of aging in time. The body slowly, you know, it ages. That's happening. That's going on. You know, there, there's science behind that. <laughs> we could we could get into that, but. That just, just let that happen. There's not a whole lot we can do about that. Can't control it. There is some studies that suggest that the more someone is grounded in the present moment in meditation, that they actually slow down the aging process. There was a study about loving, loving kindness meditation. Uh, there's these certain cells in the body. I may have talked about this before that when we're in the, the state of meditation, that they, they don't age as fast. <laughs> But I know that when I'm in that piece, just from the experience of it, I don't necessarily need the science behind it, is that I feel better, okay? no matter what's going on. Even if I'm in, in, in some pain or if I'm going through some kind of disease process, I still have the choice, no matter what's going on with the body, to tune in. I can always tune in to spirit. I've had that access point. And I truly believe that spirit gives that access point to anyone, even if they have a disability. Uh, even if they have some sort of cognitive impairment or some sort of pain or something that's very distracting, it's still an option. If it weren't, there would be no such thing as a loving God. 
it's still happening even on an island where there's no access to literature or, you know you're stuck on an island where there's no no way of knowing with words how to tune in somehow god gets there you know gets that person it happens and there's been accounts so the the message here is that everything is happening now and that i i want the the wanting to feel love to feel peace to feel connected to people must be turned into now right? it's not in the future the kingdom of heaven is not in the future never will but jesus made this very clear in the gospels it's at hand the kingdom of god is at hand it's inside me now now the mind it, it doesn't really understand this the ego cannot understand that in fact it gets dissolved when we're in the now because it's a, a totally timeless space now we might not feel that timelessness in its in its fullest capacity when we're in the now it might be like a sense of subtle sense of this this peace this precious presence and then the mind's still noisy starting to project in the future things and starting to get into the past and making lists of things that it thinks it didn't do yesterday or things it wants to do later and it just gets <laughs> full of noise and preoccupied but you can still dwell in the now while the mind's doing its thing and this is the art that we need to to live by here is being fully in the present moment while operating in this world being fully aware jesus in the course in miracles talks about the need for discernment and, and I, I, I feel as though the only way that discernment can come is from being in the moment. And so to discern when we're going to help others and, or I guess, in what way are we going to help others? Because we've all, we're always going to be making a choice to help others. But in, in what way? If we're identified with the ego and the noise, the stress and that program, and we haven't made the choice to reconnect with our, our soul, and be aware of that, then we're not really in a position to be too helpful. There, there might be some help going on, but it's not, it's not the highest level of help that can be offered. And we want to offer higher levels of help. That's really what the a congregation is. <laughs> it's more of a, a deeper connection with being. And I believe that a lot of the reason why churches have been dismantled across the, 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 uh, the globe is because that deeper meaning hasn't been awakened. It's just to kind of stay stuck and these complacent tendencies of doing the same thing over and over a lot of based on rituals, symbols, <laughs> uh, lacking substance. So the, the real substance and what that's where we really want to be helpful is coming from that place, that well of peace and love coming from there when we help. And so Jesus, if you if you read the Beatitudes and, and I've mentioned this before uh, in, in Matthew talks about. You know, when someone asks you for something, to give it to them, because it really doesn't matter. Uh, when they, uh, you know, walk a mile with them, give them your, your clothes, let them have some money, <laughs> all these things. And this may seem like, I don't want to do that, you know. And there may be times where you don't. But, but how am I saying that to someone? If someone asks me for something... And I and say that, for instance, they want to go, they're hurt. Someone is hurt, maybe financially because someone didn't pay them back money, uh, when it be a long time, or maybe it's a, a reoccurring thing. They're hurt by this. So they come to you and say, hey, I'm going to go talk to this person. They owe me money, upset about it. It's been a reoccurring theme in my life when I go talk to them about it. And uh, they have a history of, they're, they're never, they never pay you back. And you think this conversation is going to be any different? You you may suggest that they're probably not going to pay you back. <laughs> Doesn't matter. You can talk to them about it. Um, but if you still insist that they don't go there, then you're basically you're you're saying that the opposite of it is where they're going to find love by not going and talking to them. You're going to experience love. But is that really true? Because the love is really inside. So you're pointing to just another form of a dream. 
So it doesn't really matter whether they, they go there and talk to them or they don't. The goal is that they experience love. Either way could work to, for them to experience love, but enforcing that one, one preference and dream over another is not helpful. <laughs> so really to help someone, and this is what it, I guess it means is if Jesus meant for if someone asks you for something and you say, well, I don't want to do that for you, you know, uh, for you, you're basically saying the opposite is what salvation is. <laughs> so you make that real. So the, the Course in Miracles talks about this, and I want to read it. And it's taken me lots of years to really grasp this, what Jesus meant by this. Lots of stuff. And I, and I, I can't say that I'm totally there. And I, I'm reinforcing it now and, and because it's a lesson for me. So it says, the investment in reality. Jesus says, I once asked you to sell all you have and give to the poor and follow me. This is what I meant. If you have no investment in anything in this world, you can teach the poor where their treasure is. The poor are merely those who have invested wrongly, and they are indeed poor. Because they are in need, it is given you to help them since you are among them. Consider how perfectly your lesson would be learned if you were unwilling to share their poverty. For poverty is lack, and there is but one lack since there is but one need. Suppose a brother insists on having you do something you think you do leave salvation lies in it. You ever get this feeling you got someone in your life that really wants you to do something? A lot of pressure. And they believe that by you doing it, they're going to be happy. They're going to be peaceful. Their salvation lies. This happens often. I mean, it even happens at work, you know, that, you know, I, you know, a manager gives you a duty and an instruction. Do this. This is my livelihood, my job. A lot is at stake here. If you insist on refusing and experience a quick response of opposition, imagine all of us have done this. <laughs> so, you know, we don't want to do it. There's an opposition. You are believing that your salvation lies in not doing it. You then are making the same mistake he is, and you are making his heir real to both of you. Insistence means investment. And what you invest in is always related to your notion of salvation. The question is always twofold. First, what is to be saved? And second, how can it be saved? So we're, we're not trying to save either of those things. Possibly if someone were to go and bring going back to the story and approach the person like that, there was example uh, given in the light shining moments, uh, some dialogue goes, things unfold in dialogue. You know, when you face things as they are, things get undone, more gets revealed. When we try to control and guide stuff, especially special partners, families, you know, we're trying to make them safe, keep them free from harm, whatever we think's in their best interest. I'm not saying not to do that. There, these come, there comes a place for this in certain regards. But a lot of time, they need to learn through the direct experience. So what Jesus said is to walk with your brother of mine. Go visit him in jail. If he wants some money, give it to him, you know, in, in certain regards. I'm not saying all the time. Do it because <laughs> it doesn't matter. And he'll get on to say that even more. So whenever you become angry with a brother, for whatever reason, you are believing that the ego is to be saved and to be saved by attack. If he attacks, you are agreeing with this belief. And if you attack, you're reinforcing. It. Remember that those who attack are poor. Their poverty asks for gifts, not for further improvements, impoverishment. So when someone's angry that you don't give them something, they're upset. They, 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 <laughs> they're in, in poverty. They don't really know where the, where the light is. They don't know where the kingdom of heaven is. They've forgotten. They're calling out for that in a way. And they believe there's specific things that you need to do to help them to experience it. But really, it's just more of just the, the listening. So we were talking about that earlier, the listening, just being with them fully being with them and shining the light on them as they go through their process. You who could help them are surely acting destructively if you accept their poverty as yours. If you had not invested as they had, it would never occur to you to overlook their need. 
So you, you ain't look like in a specific form when someone's asking you something and they're upset or they're anxious, they, they need your help. And you say, well, I, the only way they're going to be able to be happy is if I help them in this specific way. You're actually in a way imprisoning them <laughs> because you're saying that's the only way for them to experience liberation when there's so much more going on, so much more happening inside. Things are being unraveled. We don't really know. So it says, recognize what does not matter. And if your brothers ask you for something outrageous, I love this part in the course, outrageous, do it because it doesn't matter. Refuse and your opposition establishes that it does matter to you, <laughs> that it does matter. And I'll give an example. This is kind of more of, an, of, of this in my life. So I, as many of you know, I did not get the flu vaccine for, for many years. I, I just never got it. I'm a nurse. And, um, and it was from a place of like, I just don't need it. I just don't need it. No one actually specifically asked me to get it, to, to help out anyone in a real personal way. It was just a mandation. And uh, I needed to do it in order to keep a job. And there, there was a lot of stuff involved with it. And this was going on for years. I was involved in, in, a, in a process of uh, changing a whole entire healthcare system on, on their policies of it. And uh, that uh, ended up working out, I guess, in, in whatever my, my favor was at that time. It doesn't really matter. But I didn't have to get it eventually. eventually. And then uh, in 2020, I was... Um, offered to go on a trip to go help out with COVID uh, down in uh, St. Louis. So in order to go on the trip, as part, part of the federal government, it was required to get the flu vaccine. <laughs> required at that time. So I just saw that and I was being asked, it's like, by me opposing this again, I'm, I'm making this whole story more and more real to myself. And I just, I saw it differently. Nothing, it was just like in that moment spontaneously and I just got it. And I've realized it doesn't really matter. It doesn't define me, it doesn't do it. And I just, I went with it. So this is, this is kind of how I've gone through my process with the, with the whole thing. Falling, using the discernment, dwelling in the present moment, going deeper and deeper and connecting with spirit. A lot of these things that are talked about in the Course in Miracles and the Gospels are experiential. You can't really grasp the truth behind them unless you're going deeper and deeper into the well where they come from. All this, all the writings came from somewhere. <laughs> they, they came from the formless reality that we share with God, the oneness. They flowed out of that consciousness and were written. So I've been reading about all this for years, and it was just an intuitive thing that came to me. Okay, yes, I'll do that. So I went down. And I was able to help. I was able to help out my brothers and sisters down there in St. Louis with the COVID pandemic. And it was it was ended up being a very, very challenging thing, uh, but very rewarding experience. And if I would have said no, I wouldn't have had that opportunity. And I, you know, I, I knew that. I'll just read a little more here. It is only you, therefore, who made the request outrageous, and every request of a brother is for you. Why would you insist in denying him? For to do so is to deny yourself and impoverish both. He is asking salvation, as you are. Poverty is of the ego and never of God. No outrageous, no outrageous request can be made of one who recognizes what is valuable and wants to accept nothing else. So when you really recognize what's really valuable for you, when people ask you how, what you would consider outrageous things, they don't matter anymore because you know it's really valuable. <laughs> the world can tell you all these things about what's valuable. It doesn't matter. But attacking them and pushing that, that value system away is just a part of the dream. You follow your heart. Focus on the kingdom of heaven no matter what. Just keep on doing it. Tuning in. <laughs> no matter what the world is doing. And, and, and it, Jesus talks about, you know, when people attack you and they, your enemies come after you, you, you pray for them incessantly. You just, you're there just for them. High teaching. 
difficult to do. Field takes a lot of training, mind training, like the Course in Miracles talks about going within deeply and feeling who you really are. Or in a lot of Christian themes, it's the prayer, the prayer life. A lot of mystics just simply woke up through prayer. The sincerity of just wanting to know God above all else. Julian of Norwich, St. John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, all these mystics just woke up from a place of prayer and spontaneity. They, and they may have written things later about processes, but you don't really need the process if you're really going within and, and you value that. Uh, Julian of Norwich talked about the, what she called wanting. And in her words, wanting is the same thing as, as unity, or church, unity, being, being one with God. The most important thing going on is this moment and, and feeling that oneness with God. And Juliana Norwich, the mystic, 14th century mystic, talked about, used the, the term wanting. So just wanting to merge with that, that oneness. And that's the most important thing that, that's happening for anyone is the experience of God now. Everything else is, it pales in comparison to no matter what. Yeah, even psychic abilities, healings. Essentially like Jesus resurrected uh, Lazarus, but later he died. Yeah, he came back here. But later, if Lazarus doesn't have an experience of oneness, you know, doesn't have that experience of the connection, and know who he really is, what value is it? Ultimate. The ultimate thing is that the, the oneness, your experience, your personal experience with your higher power. Now, not in the future. There's no future. <laughs> now. So let's let's close our eyes and Just make sure we're feeling comfortable in our position, in our body. Let's open up to spirit even more deeply now. The sincerity of our heart, our thoughts, our desires, our, our wanting. Let us open space to receive the Christ even more than we are now that's possible and let this this Christ presence be infused through our being from our head to our toe let it bless every cell that we can feel now flowing through us and let it flow out of us energetically into the hearts of our friends and family. Let it bless them and awaken them to the vision of Christ. Amen.